Hello. You this morning, this afternoon, whatever the time is for you. My guest today is Alistair Tate, who is the Chief Executive and Artistic Director of Young Concert Artist Trust. Young Classical London. Artist Trust. Podcast. Oh, Young Classical <laughs> Artist. Oh, my God. Young it's, like, it's a difference. Subtle difference. Uh, yes, there is. Well, actually, that raises an interesting question. But Alistair first came to Vancouver, and Alistair, I have to confess, I didn't look up the year. He came to our chamber music quartet, a chamber music festival, as a cellist in the Belcher Quartet back in the 90s. I think it's probably about 99 or 2000. Maybe actually 2000. And is that the only time that you came to Vancouver? It is. um, But I remember it so vividly for such a long time ago. And everyone who was there, because there were so many good friends there. Jerusalem Quartet were there. I remember doing... That was almost the first time. We'd done a few things over here um, because we were both with New Generation Artists and the BBC at that time. Um, Interestingly, my quartet, we were also part of YCAT at that time as well. Well, who was in charge of YCAT when you were, before you, who was your predecessor? A fellow South African for you, actually, a lady called Rosemary Pickering, um, who had been over in the UK for years. Um, She'd been running, in those days, she'd run YCAT for about 10 years, and she did about another five, six years after that till I took over yeah it was it's an interesting organization I mean when you made the 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 slip that everyone still makes of young concert artists and young classical artists of course YCAT started as young concert artist trust um and that's 35 years ago and it was founded in the same model as YCA as young concert artists um in the states and I think Susan Wadsworth was Uh, she certainly had advised a little bit about their model right at the beginning, but we're such a different country. I mean, at that time it was set up. The most important thing about YCAT is it's a charity. We're not commercial. And that is actually at the heart of everything we do. And from the beginning, the mission has been who can, who are the most exceptional young artists who show potential for an international career? And I've added, I add something to that, which is who are the artists that YCAT can help the most? Because as a charity, it's so important for us to be finding artists that we believe are really open, are curious, are switched on about who else is out there, who are their colleagues, um, willing to take advice, try it out, see what clothes fit them in a way musical clothes in a similar way to how YCA started in the states but I think YCAT in the last 30 years has really built to a much more international level. So when did you change it from Young Concert Artist Trust to Young Classical Artist Trust? Very soon after I took over actually. Ah. Um, I've been which is coming up for 12 years if you can believe it. No. Um, it time passes so quickly but I just felt when I took over, it, it felt not stagnant, but as all organizations at some point, they start to just get a bit used to what they're doing. And I think certainly when I was brought in, I had no experience. I was a cellist and a teacher. The chairman at that time of YCAT, they were looking for a, a new chief executive. And I'll never forget, I was in Manchester teaching Death in the Maiden Quartet, and I'd left my mobile phone on that heinous of crimes for any teacher to leave their phone on during a lesson oh. and my phone went off in the middle of the slow movement of death and the maiden oh. with this young group and the chairman who, wonderful man brian mcmaster who was the director of oh, the edinburgh sure. festival for years he was here he ran vancouver yes for absolutely yeah yeah but so brian just said okay do you want to run ycat and i just went oh. what why would i do this But we talked a bit later and it was one of these, a lot of musicians often ask me what have been some of the most important decisions in your life. And I think the only advice I would ever give them is to always be open to what's unexpected. Um, And this was unexpected. And I realized that the idea hadn't gone. 
from me for a few days. So I phoned him up again and talked and said, look, I'm not ready to try and just do a run a charity full time. I love teaching. I get so much from working with young groups. And I was do already doing a lot of master classes abroad and starting to teach in Banff every summer. And I, the connection with the young artists is the thing that's so important for me. And he said, but that's why I'm asking you. He said, we've already done a big search and all the usual people have come up for it. But he said, we need something different. We need a new perspective. And so for the first few years, I was doing 50-50, continuing to teach, run the whole chamber music department in Manchester, latterly then at Guildhall in London, and running the charity. I think for me, it was knowing, as I said, having been a YCAT artist in the past, I knew how important that was for our quartet at that point. And also knowing what were the challenges for artists, seeing them coming out of conservatoire, still being so connected with the sort of international scene, having been there, A, as a performer, as a recording artist. For me, part of the joy of being in quartet, of course, it's playing in a quartet, but it's the people first and foremost, it's the communication, it's the it's the conversation you can have at so many different levels, both on and off the stage. So also the post-concert work for musicians is just as important as the actual concert work. That's when you get to know people and running a charity, it's the same thing. It's about building the connections, inspiring people. And I think just being honest with people that we are here to really help who we believe are some of the most interesting musicians. So we are going to be partnering with you and doing this series of, what do you call them? Video concerts? I don't know what to call them. I think they're concerts. I mean, the concerts. artists, we've, we've got four concerts and the artists are treating them like a, a live concert. A There's live no editing. They're yes. sitting down with a camera and the adrenaline is going. We've just had two of them recorded in, uh, in the last few days. Um, ben Baker has just recorded his dual recital with Timothy Ridda really? yesterday. And Emma Nikolovska, um, Canadian Macedonian mezzo, um, recorded in the Bule Sal last weekend. Yes. And yes. both of them, the first thing they were on the phone to us straight away saying, it's just such a thrill to be able to do a live concert again. For them, it's knowing that there is, albeit with a delay of a few weeks, there's a direct connection between them standing and that camera and your audience there. And that's just brought them all to life again. That's what they've missed. So if we take the general um, situation with really gifted young musicians who were really starting out on their careers and beginning to make uh, inroads, um, and then the pandemic hit. If and when, please God, this is behind us, do, will they have to start again at square one? I mean, how difficult is it to pick up where you left off? It's so hard. Um, it, feels, it feels for some of the young artists, especially at the level where look at the international ones at YCAT, who maybe haven't been heard yet, but everyone knows that because they're suddenly at YCAT, the visibility is so high for them. People are starting to notice them, starting to talk about them. And we always talk in the office about the momentum. When an artist starts to get this momentum, it's a very tangible thing. It's hard to describe, but it's very tangible. I do feel there's a danger that they're going to get sandwiched between much more established artists who, are desperate just to keep resurrecting the career. They're going to have to go through the same struggles, but they're already better known. And you've also got the next generation of up and coming musicians who are going to be squeezing from the yes, other of angle. Course. And exactly. I think it's, it's going to be a really tough three, four years for young artists. It's been really interesting for me watching how our artists over the last year have been coping with everything going on around us even learning a little bit more about those who really are resilient, others who have really struggled in a funny way at the beginning, the first few months of COVID, watching not just Waika artists, but in general, for me, some of the most interesting creative um, 
sensitive artists were the one that were the ones that really struggled because they were somehow much more open and taking in so much of what was going on around them and the crisis mm -hmm. and some of them just couldn't even face practicing for a month month or a couple of months it really rocked them but in a way they're the ones I think a lot of these musicians who found it difficult at the beginning are the ones who've really been able to look again at who they are as an artist think quite deeply about their connection what is the role of a musician in society I mean I think it's thrown up some really fundamental questions. IAMA, which is International Artists Management Association, to which we belong proudly, uh, sent out an email this morning announcing this upcoming conference of the British Orchestra. Yeah. And saying that there were they felt a few topics that their IAMA members might be interested in. And they there are two topics in that conference that I am absolutely yearning to know more about. One of the things they're going to be talking about is artist contracts in the future and this sort of notion of force majeure and cancellation and postponement and all this sort of thing. It's an interesting topic. I mean, this is where, this is one of the areas where I put my hands up and proudly say, why cats a charity? We're not in it to make lots and lots of commercial money, like a commercial management company, where all the clauses and all the the artist management companies are going through a huge crisis at the moment. I'm not going to comment on that, but I think YCAT's different role is so important. We we are nine, 85 to 90 percent reliant on philanthropy. Yeah. So, so are we. that means, and what that means is that. Every single part of the thing we do is manage our artists, but we're managing, sometimes our artists are on the phone every single day. We mm -hmm. are pretty much their entire source of income. And for a young artist, a really successful young pianist, or even the Castalian Quartet who came out to you last year. Yes, and you're coming they, back. A young, a young European group at a point when perhaps there's and this is where I was in the Belcha Quartet at the same time, mm -hmm. maybe about 90 to 100 concerts a year internationally. You're lucky yeah. if you're making about £20,000 each before tax. People have no idea no. of the level no. of fees. So the most important thing for us is, yes, to generate work for the artists, to get them known and to pass them on to the management. But really importantly, we are not reliant on the commission. So... If an artist, if it's not right, the right time for an artist to do a concert, it's not the right year, it's not the right. If they say, you know, we need to go and take six months to go and do a residency in Bath or somewhere, we want to explore ourselves. We are there to say, this is what you need to do. We're not yeah. there to actually generate money. The money is coming from a different place. So that that whole developmental aspect for the artists to give them space, to give them time to actually find out through experimentation who they really are as an artist and that if the journey has been the right journey over the four or five years they're with us that's normally a very different place to where we maybe thought they were when we selected them the other thing that we've also really expanded over this last year um we've been thinking about it before covid hit but it's obviously covid's accelerated it but it's been so important for us is building I think one of the first completely free, accessible online resources for any emerging musician, for any freelance musician. And that's, so I see it as like an online library or like an online personal trainer for emerging young musicians. And I think it's such an important part that it's not just the elite young artists we look after. Of course, they're the core of our work, but I think there's a responsibility for us to be where else do young musicians go nowadays? It's very hard for them. They emerge from a very um, closeted environment within conservatoires who are giving a lot of training to them. But yeah. once musicians emerge into the profession, that's when they most of them wake up and think, oh, I wish I'd listened. I know someone told me about this a few years ago. But when they're out in the profession, where do they go? And so I think there's a huge responsibility for us. But why can't I? We, I'm not saying we know the answers to everything, 
but I think our role as a sort of mo the most obvious destination for artists to come to ask advice, we can easily pass them on to other people. We're a place for them to connect with as well um, and meet with other musicians. So that's something I'm really proud, proud of this year. To what extent do you think, I mean, I remember again, once being years ago at an IAMA conference in London, and there was a panel about something and there was a young student who had just graduated from the Royal Academy. And uh, he was saying that all of a sudden he felt as though he'd fallen into a deep chasm because he felt well looked after at the Academy. And now yeah. he didn't know what to do or how to go about trying to push himself it's, in the so and I'm sh that was quite a long time ago and maybe things have changed now but to what extent one of the most common it's one of the most responsibility common of them well why don't the doesn't well, the music academy do. have a responsibility to do something like mm. that to train them they in absolutely do but, and they are and they are i work very closely with all the conservatoires and they're working very very hard to actually provide a lot of this training um, for the musicians. But there is something, I think in many professions, it's when they actually find themselves on their own. That's when the decisions really matter. And I think there's a slightly more philosophical angle to it, but again, quite real of how much within the musician's sense of their own identity when they're growing up, it's very blinkered for nearly all musicians. It's just how we do. We just, we're dedicated to our art, learning the craft. And the craft is the most important thing. And all these other things, the career things, you, you look at them, but you just think, okay, I, I want to be successful. And the harder I work, I will be successful. And it's the reality of, well, there's lots of people out there who are just as good. So what differentiates someone who's really... Mm -hmm actually connecting and that's a tough lesson for people i there's a lot of coaching sessions which i've given to young musicians all of which after even five minutes of what they think they've come to talk about it's very quickly down to this point of um i just feel i'm up against a brick wall i'm doing if i think i'm playing as well as i can but somehow i'm just not being heard for a lot of them there's a realization of um, I've always loved doing different things, but if I were to look at a different aspect of the music industry, and it's trying to exactly, think of them, look at exactly. the skills, look at the skills yes. that you have honed, your understanding of yourself, your understanding of other people through your chamber music, your ability to self-organize, to discipline yourself, to actually take a problem apart. All of these skills are invaluable in other areas of the music profession, but it's seen by a lot of them as that they're giving up and they're failing. And it's trying to reframe the question to say, if you are happier and actually more fulfilled doing something that you get a lot of energy and feel very valued from, who knows, you might actually start to play even better in another, in another way. This is exactly where I was going because uh, it's it's so unfortunate and, I, and maybe it's the way our society works these days. So, and again, I'm speaking from where I am here in Vancouver, where there are at, at the University of British Columbia's music school, there's the Vancouver Academy of Music and they have a lot of, they produce some really wonderful students, but not everybody who goes into these institutions are going to end up having a career touring the world. So, and in fact, in fact, there are a couple of young musicians I have mentored over the years who I've become close to. And it's not my, what I really want to say to them is, you have so many other qualities as well that there is really a place for you in music and it doesn't have to be touring. There are so many other ways in which you can make a very valuable contribution to the music world. 
because you have all these other assets as well. It's such an important part of a conversation, ongoing conversation we have with Concert Artists Guild in New York. So we have this very strong partnership now with WICAP and Concert Artists Guild. It's very much at the heart of their ethos, Tanya Bannister, their president, really looking at what is a modern musician? What are the keys to success? We all know that the level is the given, but actually how are they thinking about their impact in different areas? Are they interested in different areas of the world, in different aspects of um, sort of how they connect with different communities, different socioeconomic backgrounds? And this is not dumbing down the standard at all. It's who are the interesting musicians that actually feel they've got something to give? And actually more than that, that there's a responsibility for a younger generation of artists to feel they are giving something back and inspiring the next generation and actually being part of a more connected fabric of society. And I think it's one of the things that really connects what we're doing together. This series of four concerts we're going to be doing, um, I'm so excited. I just, I just beside myself. Um, and it's so nice to have something to look forward to because God knows when we'll all be able to start up again. And particularly here in Vancouver, where we depend upon artists coming from elsewhere, um, yeah. travel restrictions. So it's lovely to have something concrete and exciting to, to be looking forward to. So we've come up with quite a variety of uh, musical mm -hmm. disciplines which I'm really excited about. I think I gave you a little smorgasbord of potential. So uh, the main criteria for me, of course, is who are the most interesting artists? And I think this, the programme we've put together, together, uh, you and I, I think it really shows the breadth of artists we have at YCAT. I mean, I'm only ever looking, I'm only ever looking for an individual that I think has a really strong voice. Each of these individuals is already recognized internationally in such a clear way because they're such great proponents of their craft um, yeah. and their instruments. So what we yeah. put together, we have um, this extraordinary girl. I mean, we adore her. She's a force of nature. Um, I've mentioned her before, Emma Nikolovska, um, <laughs> Canadian. Um, she's Macedonian, but from very, very early on, brought up in Toronto, went to the Glen Gould School as a violinist, actually. She trained as a violinist with Barry Schiffman, um, but was always singing on the side and then came over to Guildhall um, a few years ago in London. And she's the most extraordinary personality. Her mind is so quick and I just can't wait for you and her to have a conversation because I think it will be quite something to watch. Um, but she's in Berlin at the moment because of quarantine restrictions. When we were planning it, it was suddenly impossible for her to get back into this country without 10 days quarantine. So her and the wonderful Jonathan Ware, who's one of our accompanists, the um, pianist we've had, who's doing such great work out in Berlin now. And he's, I think he's coming to you anyway at some point. Yes, he's perhaps, coming with, with Golda, uh, Golda, with Golda Schultz. Schultz. Please, God, it's going to happen. Who's very good partnership there. But they managed to find to persuade the the wonderful Boulez Sal um, to do the recording for them. So it's a lovely partnership because we work closely with them as well. Yes, but because Kirsten and I are are good friends, so it, it just came together so brilliantly. Then we have um, again slightly off the beaten track, but still violin and viola duo recital. So Benjamin That's Baker. That's on my track. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. Benjamin Baker and Timothy Ridda, who's an extraordinary viola player. I think one of the most exciting viola players around internationally now yes. at the moment. Um, and they're just such good friends. And so they've put lovely program together for you. Then we have a young pianist, Israeli pianist, who's finishing at the Royal Academy at the moment. Um, but I've seen him. He's not actually... Officially with YCAT at the moment, he was one of our finalists last year. And because we couldn't have live auditions, what we did for a specific year was offer all 12 of the finalists a sort of package of advice and support. Um, because nothing, it's 
It's not as if we were able to actually manage any of them. And it's so important for me to have live editions. But Ariel, um, Ariel Lange is, again, really interesting musician. I've seen him develop over quite a few years now. And he's arriving back today into the UK. He's been at home in Israel. And of course, is now back in the UK, having had both his vaccination jabs. So we're yeah. all very envious. Of yes, him. yes, yes. Um, yeah. But he's, he's put together a, a lovely programme for you, sort of Haydn, Again, that's it's more of a sort of little debut program, I think, which really yeah. shows him in a different light with um, Scriabin and Schubert, Haydn and Shemovsky. Right. And then the final program, this is the one I I think you will surprise many of your audience, perhaps, but it's such an interesting program, and it's our recorder player, Tabea de Boos. Um, she extraordinary artist again such a very clever thinker about programming she's also with concert artist guild in new york um she did both editions at the same time before we'd actually joined together she's just recorded this program um for a record company delphian records with whom we have a partnership ongoing partnership now with wica um but really interesting idea all based around the idea of an earworm um, and how for, it's not just a sort of um, the last few decades of songs that get into our heads, but this has been yeah. happening for centuries. And what were the earworms of the day? And she has such a beautiful sort of structure of a program she's put together with lute and viola da gamba. Um, yes. And it really is, some of them you'll know really well. Um, some of the arrangements will be well known melodies, but in a different guise and you also see the record all the many different recorders she has and yes such yes. an interesting artist so but it's just I think the most important thing is just to say such a huge thank you because I think this opportunity for the artists at the moment any opportunity to perform is always so important for them but at a time like this this is gold dust and I'm just oh, so well. so grateful on their behalf so and I just it's such a great way for us to be able to introduce these artists that we really believe in to your audience and that's such a great chance for us. This is the essence of what the VRS is and uh, as long as we can keep doing this we will do it. I mean this is just please God we'll all survive this and yeah. be able to not only continue but thrive whether it be in slightly yeah. different ways or whatever yeah. but we have to we look will. ahead. We will. Yeah. And I okay. personally can't wait for when I can actually get on a plane and come over yes, and be in Vancouver with you in person. <laughs> yes, wonderful. We'll aim yeah. at that. Yeah. Have a wonderful you, rest of your day. Take care, Alistair. You too. Thank Lovely you to see you. Bye bye, Leila. Okay. Bye. bye.